Thank you everyone for coming. I know it's the end of the day, I know it's the end of a big week, but we're all really excited. We got a great panel here for you and I'm super excited to kick it off. Um, so my name is Anna. Uh, I currently lead um, community programs on the ecosystem team at the Cello Foundation. And I was previously at Maker Foundation and I'm gonna first give you a little bit of a background for how I ended up in this space and how I kind of started thinking about this, this panel and this idea and why I became really fascinated with the topic of ecosystem growth and funding ecosystem specifically. Um, so I wanna give you an example, like working for, nobody works for Ethereum and in the same way nobody works for Celo, but a lot of us work on ecosystem. And it doesn't mean that there aren't people working for it, but there's people working for different entities that are funding ecosystem growth and ecosystem development. And watching the um, ecosystem at Maker first being bootstrapped by Maker Foundation and then decentralizing to be entirely managed by the DAO, I started thinking about how do we think about different levers that we have to leverage ecosystem growth. At a foundation, the primary lever that we have is grants, um, but in, and, and usually they are coordinated by um, a, pretty centralized um, group of people, but at a DAO, it can be uh, managed by a governance community, uh, you can tap into on-chain funding, and then you can also have various new methods of ecosystem growth, like uh, DAO to DAO swaps and other various tooling. So I wanna give first um, everyone a chance to give an introduction, uh, starting with Juan, and maybe you can tell a little bit of a background for how you've seen this happen at Maker. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Uh, I'm Juan from the Sustainable Ecosystem Scaling core unit at MakerDAO. I joined Maker um, right before the foundation started to, to dissolve. So uh, yeah, it was very, very chaotic and extremely interesting. Um, and since then, I've been pretty much working on scaling the ecosystem. Um, we used to do a lot of different things yeah, uh, in the beginning. Um, we were very, <clears throat> a team that was very, um, that different, uh, so, so very, the, the skills were very were very mixed, uh, and that was extremely interesting. And then through the last year and a half or so, uh, we've been like specializing, and now we are we're we're on building the like operational tools for the centralized workforce, um, then legal resilience, and and finally what we call governance design, uh, because we haven't found a better name yet. But um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, what I've been doing for the last year. So very much looking forward to, to speaking here with these great people. Thank you, and kicking off to Abby. Hi, my name is Abby. Um, my role now is uh, the head of community and governance at Radical. So for those who don't know Radical, um, we basically build decentralized collaboration tools and infrastructure for people building decentralized technologies. Um, and so, uh, but we really consider ourselves even more so than a crypto project, we consider ourselves more so a free and open source project. Um, and so my view on ecosystem scaling definitely comes from uh, the concept of like ecosystem in open source uh, projects and communities. Um, and you realize that in like Web3, everything's open source. And so inherently, you know, we're actually building open source ecosystems and communities. And so it's been um, over the last couple of years there, stewarding governance and working on community. I think that it's all been about like combining our crypto community and ecosystem learnings and what it means to scale a crypto ecosystem with what does it mean to scale like an open source project in an open source ecosystem. So, um, and I think the difference there is how do we progressively decentralize to uh, support the emergence and autonomy of an open source ecosystem. And I think my uh, focus has been on like optimistically designing new futures in which decentralized technologies can better support the coordination and growth of open source ecosystems and the resilience of open source ecosystems system. So, um, so yeah, so right now how we're acting on that and kind of what we're trying to do in practice is um, one of my main projects right now is helping lead the, our transition to the DAO, which means a lot of things, but basically means progressively decentralizing uh, the project from where we were prior, which was 
basically like a venture funded startup to a foundation with um, you know a token governed DAO to now the next stage which is you know dissolving aspects of the radical foundation and transitioning those responsibilities to an autonomous decentralized entity that lives within the DAO is funded via the DAO um, and acts as a participant within the DAO um, among other orgs that will slowly emerge over time so um, yeah in that process we're thinking a lot about what it means to not only scale an ecosystem but support an ecosystem that's scaling um, and what foundations do you need to put in place to um, you know kind of actually support growth um, and resilience throughout a progressive decentralization or transition um, and so we excited to chat about that today yeah and progressive decentralization is the reason that I'm so excited to be sharing the stage with y'all because I feel like we are, we've been at different stages of this, um, and we've seen this through the ecosystem perspective, but Alp, I really wanna hear your background and how do you think about ecosystem? Yeah, thank you. Hey guys, it's Alp. Um, I started my journey like a, as, as an entrepreneur, let's say like a couple of years back with a Web2 startup working on like agri agriculture and like food technologies. Uh, then I started to participate in circular economies research in the United Nations and European Union under some organizations there and worked a lot on the ground and uh, tried to understand actually what we could do to improve the lives of people in developing countries more. Um, then I joined first with Gitcoin, then I started with PrimeDAO, then now I'm doing something called Inverter Network, which is we're trying to learn the traditional know-how from international organizations like United Nations and European Union, which they have something called Data Portal, where they receive like all the applications like grant applications and they pay milestone-based funding to these organizations and like uh, individuals trying to empower them, trying to teach them with mentors and program managers such as like uh, ourselves in the end of the day. Um, and now we're trying to understand basically how we can design an ecosystem where the whole empowerment of the individuals can affect the coordination throughout, can generate this crypto network effects that can improve our, basically the games that we play, you know, with economical senses. I'm excited to share this stage with all of you, to be honest. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you. And for my own background, I actually also started within the maker ecosystem. And the reason I'm so interested in funding mechanisms is because I myself originally started in Web3 as a beneficiary of a grant from what we then called community development at the Maker Foundation. And that was really a program to incubate the next generation of people that will eventually take over a lot of the functions uh, and be able to manage maker protocol through the DAO. And so through through that experience, and I, I, learned, I learned so much because that was such a pivotal time in our, um, for, well for maker, but also for the entire ecosystem because maker I think was one of the first and really big projects to do that kind of transition. And then going to Sela Foundation, I saw, I saw the same, Thing happening but a lot earlier on um, and I kind of had this I, I had the front row seat to seeing how to make this the ecosystem scaling sustainable you really have to encourage and you have to design for intentionally for people to be able to have this independent thinking to be able to decide on what things are meaningful for the ecosystem an independent process which has to do with um, like how do you apply for grants, how do you access funding, in a DAO this has to do with uh, a lot of core units which is a framework that we'll jump into next. And then also independent sources of funding because ultimately having funding at your disposal is what allows you to have agency. And if you have agency then you can really execute on the things that are really meaningful for your ecosystem. But to jump into what ecosystem development really means, uh, I wanna ask this to each one of you, because what I learned going from protocol like Maker to a project like Cello, which is a layer one, is that a layer one, your ecosystem is really dependent on your application layer and on your uh, projects and companies that are d developing in your ecosystem. And also, of course, like your community and your users and your advocates and lots of other uh, stakeholders, but primarily it's about developing an application layer. But what does ecosystem development mean at uh, a project like Maker? Yeah, I, I, I like what uh, Abby said, but uh, I don't think that um, that governance should be an afterthought ever. Um, you really need to work on the supporting mechanisms and structures and all these frameworks that will allow you to scale properly. Otherwise, you end up uh, with this type of, uh, yeah, people screaming at each other. Um, I don't know. Um, so pretty much it's like you have this bricked version of governance that doesn't allow you to, to keep going and, and, and looking forward and, um, and you end up with a mess. Um, 
I can I can speak a bit more about Maker uh, if you guys we'll want. We'll talk about the challenges <laughs> <laughs> and why why it feels like we'll sometimes get <laughs> we'll get we'll get to why it feels so, like running into a brick wall coordinating governance. Yeah, so to just give you the the very quick overview, um, <laughs> the, the way we organized it in the beginning was very uh, optimistic, if you if you'd like, uh, and that's why right now I'm a bit uh, reticent about any any type of op optimistic uh, kind of grant or or funding mechanism. And um, what we did is that anyone can come and permission, permissionlessly start uh, a core unit and get funding. Um, and it is very, very hard for, if, if there are no structure there to actually report on, on progress, on milestones, on, on what's happening, what's there to be achieved, uh, you end up with uh, many delegates that uh, have never run a company uh, trying to judge uh, a topic that they might not understand and there's no auditor or auditing function within this, uh, so you end up with uh, a mess. And that's a bit what we're trying to work on uh, nowadays uh, through maker governance um, and governance design. Nice. Um, nice. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that in the case of Radical and maybe more generally like open source ecosystems, I think that there's like different layers of ecosystem development, right? So I think that there's like ecosystem scale, which is related to increasing the number of participants, whether that be like users, contributors, maintainers, whatever you'd like. Um, and that's kind of also community, right? Which is like building, um, obviously for an open source project, that's uh, your maintainers and your contributors. And being able to grow your contributors is um, a really important part of ecosystem development. And then there's resilience, which I think, um, and I would also say what interplays with that is like diversity, so like resilience and diversity. So what you were saying is like having a really strong, diverse application layer network ecosystem is really important for like a layer one. It actually goes the same, I think, for like open source infrastructure in which you want to be able to have um, a more diverse client ecosystem or at least like technical in ecosystem um, to ensure the project's like longer term resilience. And so I think that that's like a really important part um, and is why like um, things like grants and RFPs and bounties are really great because basically you're growing the number of people who are working on the project and you're also increasing the diversity of the project. So um, so that's one and then I think that there's this other con like dimension of development which is like um, I, I guess it's kind of like developing the ecosystem, you know what I mean? Which is like not just having a bunch of people, but actually um, having kind of more of an idea of how you're growing people in an ecosystem. So like what you were saying, like how um, you know grants were meant to empower new people to take over leadership roles. I think that this is like an incredibly important point of ecosystem, which is like ecosystem development, which is not just like bringing people in and then just like having them there. It's like bringing them in and then developing them and like helping them support and empowering them and growing them into leadership positions and, and just becoming like long-term participants. And I actually think that this is like low-key the most important and hardest one to do, which is like how do you get people uh, to stick around? How do you create longer-term incentives? Um, and how do you embed like longer-term commitment? Because often this is what's actually necessary to um, kind of like realize all of these uh, ecosystem visions. Um, and so I think that all of those are, yeah, <laughs> pretty hard to do. They all interplay with each other, but I think um, there's a lot of ways to kind of like stimulate each type of development, so. Yeah. It, it almost seems that we, we had all the tools and smart contracts and to make it very programmatic and we just copied what we've seen from, from companies or startups and we said, okay, we'll run with this. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's a huge miss opportunity there that, that we're not exploring. I'm like kind of I'm like kind of pessimistic on just programming incentives because I don't think that it often in introduces or encourages the correct behavior. But it is true is that we do have kind of we have different tools, and we should be experimenting with like how those tools look like in the long term. I mean, we kind of are with like tokens, right? Like that's basically like a long term incentive mechanism that we're trying to experiment and build governance around. Um, but yeah, we're definitely like applying the corp reform like way too much. And I think it's just us trying to like process a new design space and like also trying to make things work at the same time, you know? Well, I think this has to do with um, like we all like to talk about onboarding, but like, what, what are we actually onboarding into? And I Working at Maker, I really saw this very clearly. I think there's the onboarding into the technical protocol, and then there's onboarding into social protocol. Mm -hmm. And the social protocol is what's really difficult because that's like that's at the core of how do we coordinate with each other. Like we can have all of the tech stack in the world, but how do we actually implement those things? How do we coordinate? How do we agree? How do we govern well together? Like the social protocol 
is the one that's much more, I think, difficult um, to build. Um, and so, Alp, I think you have a really interesting perspective that's external to like an ecosystem. It has more to do with um, maybe like developing regional ecosystems. So I, I'd love to hear more about how you yeah, think yeah. about ecosystem. Thank you. Just to add really quick, like uh, the other day, a friend of mine told me flow of capital is the flow of trust. So when it comes to ecosystem design as well, like the understanding contributor taxonomy and like uh, kind of building the development projects in the regions where it's required, we really need to understand like the kind of the requirements of the system we want to design on the ecosystem side as well. And like once we understand the system that we want to design, then we can understand the goals that we want to achieve. And in the meantime, if we have the data sets uh, to incentivize, we can understand and like uh, we can basically build on parameters on projects that we actually want to kind of in, uh, interject into that region. So for example, if you would have uh, specific development projects in some regions, and you could actually have a database to basically see those uh, milestones and deliverables that they need to do, and also like we can incentivize, understand the incentivization methods that have been used by different protocols and different entities, whether they are decentralized organizations or traditional organizations. I think we can also like uh, kind of have a different perspective to the ecosystem design where the focus would be public goods plus empowerment of the local communities. And I think like also Maker and like Celo are very focused on the regional based ecosystem design, which I really enjoy. So um, I think like last year we were talking with you, like you were kind of mentioning some ecosystem design perspective of yours in the local communities and economies. It would be interesting to go into that level as well, if you remember. The whole grant programs in like uh, in African regions and we yeah. how we could actually establish like a kind of block spaces for people to develop themselves and empower themselves. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Well, actually, this ties in um, into how, like, the next question that I wanted to go into, which is, like, where are we coming from? Like, what is the past case scenario? And, like, how did we used to think about ecosystem growth versus how are we thinking about it now and what is to look forward to in the future? And when I got to Celo a year, almost a year and a half ago, um, the Celo Foundation was the only uh, entity that was thinking about ecosystem development and so foundation kind of like set a lot of the goals and like regions and priorities for where we want to develop but now we have created a whole system of governance where people are able to tap into on-chain uh, funding from the protocol and establish their own independent entities that are able to set their own priorities and their own goals so right now in the forum there's actually several proposals for uh, a LATAM regional DAO and for Africa regional DAO that will um, access funding from the protocol and have this like have the benefit of the independent thinking which like they are actually based there like they are in touch with the local community they're able to make best decisions but then also will be able to set their own process for how they want to manage grants how they want to like plan that entire ecosystem how they want to manage deliverables and also have the funding in their multi-sig to be able to act on those uh, things so if there's like a hackathon they want to sponsor regionally then they can and I think that is huge power and like a tremendous responsibility um, but this is yeah this has to do with where we came from and, and where we're going but um, yeah the next question was going to be for kind of talking about what was the past case scenario and where how, how is it developing now at um, each of the other projects you want me to start <laughs> sure I can talk okay I'll talk maybe about general previous state as I've seen and kind of what nuances of like our current state that I think are different. So I think in like previous state, at least not for like open source ecosystems specifically, because those are basically, you know, like decentralized ecosystems in at their core. I think that there is obviously like a much more like centralized approach to ecosystem development in general, in which there is like a directed force that's like kind of, um, yeah, just like creating the community and like running the community. I think of like, um, I don't know if like Notion is a really good example of this, but like previous projects that have like have been built on like creator communities in which there's kind of this like top down directed force um, that's driving an ecosystem forth, right? And it's uh, very branded, it's like very um, directed, it's very structured, often has its own hierarchies because um, ecosystem is being is looked at as like a means of like growth, right? And um, so yeah, I think that's like, the previous state. And so I think that like now what's different is that we have a lot more headless ecosystems, right? Like headless brands, headless ecosystems in which people are um, identifying with different ecosystems and communities without being explicitly tied to 
it itself. Like we're all part of the Ethereum community. Like I think about how I got into Ethereum and it was through a hackathon and I just started like hacking, right? I know it's. I didn't know that. I love it's it. Exactly. No, that's like a very OG hacker with like I Griff Green at like Common Stack and everything um, before I found Radical. And I think that this aspect of community is something that, again, very much so. Um, parallels like open source ecosystems in which like for example like Rust is this like insane ecosystem right and but it's very headless in that there's like obviously because it's a language right it's like a bunch of people building this language and building things on top of it um, and other open source ecosystems exhibit this trait as well and so I feel like um, now we're seeing companies try to frame themselves as open source ecosystems because they're building open source software yet they're also building uh, companies and, and projects, right? And I think now we're seeing this like mesh of two worlds in which this previous state of kind of like central top-down community ecosystem growth and scaling and this like more decentralized emergent um, uh, headless ecosystem approach in crypto right now. And I think that that's kind of like why it's I think hard and people try to apply the corporate form because at the end of the day we're not building on entirely vol volunteer volunteeristic Voluntary, altruistic, volunteer-based network. Internal, networks. yeah. I think like intrinsic the word. motivation. You know what I'm trying to say. Um, we're, you know, we're building projects that have um, actually like a lot of like long-term incentives and value networks attached to them. Yet we're building open source ecosystems at the same time, and I think that that's why it's so tough for us to try to like process like where to go. And I think governance is actually the answer because that's a tooling that we can use to kind of figure it out. But um, yeah, so I think that we're just like seeing this clash of like this top-down versus headless approach, um, and I think it's really exciting to start embracing new forms of the headless ecosystem growth approach as we start looking forward. Yeah. Juan, maybe you can tell us why governance is the answer. Yeah, what, what we've noticed is that um, it's, uh, I mean, we, we kind of predicted that this was going to happen and make a scale to a size uh, that it's hard to tell. Like the count of uh, contributors is some, somewhere between 120 to 170. Um, and this is because, again, it's, it's decentralized, so it's, it's hard to tell. But uh, what we failed to build uh, when, we, when we started is this, um, these frameworks to, to allow for MKR holders to direct value. So we went from a foundation very clear, top-down. Um, and if you want, we can argue about the benefits of its grants uh, and how that worked uh, for better and worse. And then we went to this, uh, to this mechanism where you have a lot of core units, uh, and there's really no incentive to integrate or to collaborate. So every core unit is, uh, we have a very flat uh, hierarchy and there's no, there's no way for MKR holders to push core units to work together or to integrate or to, um, yeah, to, to make things happen and to create value for the protocol. So uh, I think that's something we will see in the, in the next couple of months is we're going to see a trend that uh, shifts from onboarding people, which is bring as many people as you can to, um, how do we build these coordination mechanisms to make sure that we can actually coordinate? So right now there's no tool that I'm aware of and if you're building something, please reach out uh, to actually build consensus and make sure that uh, we can create a decentralized strategy uh, that involves the owner of the projects that are the ones holding the tokens. So um, yeah, I might be diverging a bit too much, but... Uh, no, no, I think this is great. And actually I think this, this is a great example of like a past state and moving into a current state, but can you give us an example of like what what what, what is a core unit and how did you because um, you really helped write the MIP set that established core units. So can you tell us I'm a sorry. little bit more about like what what core units were what, what core units were meant to be and what the promise of core units was versus like where it is now a year, almost a year and a half later. Yeah, so we we got inspired I think from from software a bit. So we went to the highest abstraction and we say well we said what what do you need? Uh, and Every single project, organization, anything, it's, uh, it's work, uh, which is what are we trying to get done. It's the workforce, which is who's contributing, and it's the, the, the incentives or the capital. So basically, that's, that, that was it. Uh, you, if you fill a MIP39, um, there you declare what your mission is and what you're trying to achieve for, for Maker. The MIP40 is, um, and a MIP is a Maker improvement proposal. Um, MIP 40 is a budget, so I'm requesting this much money. I'm going to hire all these people, and or, 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 yeah. And and then the MIP uh, 41 was the the facilitator, which is the kind of like the, the responsible person accountable to governance regarding this um, regarding this process. And uh, I think that everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. So we learned a lot from it. 
uh, we ended up with the facilitator-less core units. Uh, we ended up with anonymous offboardings of core units that were not working out. Uh, we ended up, I don't know, upsizing and downsizing budgets. Uh, so it was extremely messy. Uh, we learned a lot. Um, and, and yeah, that, that's, that's a bit the, the, where, where we are today. And if, if you have heard about the end game plan, the end game plan, that's why it sounds so, uh, so crazy. But it's because we need to um, make the, I think we need to make the, ex, the implicit complexity, we need to make it explicit, and we need to make sure that everyone understands. Otherwise, you end up in this uh, in these DAOs where the the very strong personalities kind of like get away with everything, and and the you can call them the nice people, I guess, uh, as a euphemism, uh, end up like push aside. So so that's a bit what we're trying to to work with right now. The offboarding proposal is really interesting and really really key. And when I got to Cello, I realized that we have a way to tap into this pool of money. At, a, at the protocol level and the on-chain funding, but we actually have no offboarding proposal to claw those funds back wh whenever something goes wrong. If something inevitably at one point does go wrong, um, because we are all still learning and we are still trying to understand like how to, how to operate and how to operationalize this new paradigm. Like we all can talk about the ideas behind it, but then once you start to operationalize it, you realize once the core units have been out in the wild for a year, you realize all the things that have gone wrong. Abby, do you have any like parallels to core units at Radical, and how do you think about like how independent entities can tap into that funding? And yeah, if you've thought about onboarding and offboarding proposals. Wow, so much. <laughs> we took a lot of inspiration. Uh, so again, we're currently like in the midst of this like transition, right? So we're currently designing the organizational framework that will. Um, absorb the responsibilities that currently uh, remain in the Foundation Council for directing, coordinating, and funding all core team development. So our core units are technically called core teams, right? Um, and so in that process, we've kind of like scoped out like a new ecosystem design in which instead of envisioning the Radical DAO just funding one core team, again, in the essence of open source and decentralization, we envision the DAO, which is a community-governed treasury, um, funding different orgs, which act as these like nested poly centric you know organizations that kind of resemble sub DAOs in the sense that they have their own governance processes they have their own memberships um, but they still require a certain trust level delegated from the DAO right and so in that process um, in these orgs then become responsible for being independent thinkers funders and have their own process uh, within the DAO using Anna's framework um, about like uh, that they all are then kind of trusted to allocate capital within their mandate. And so then they fund teams. And so teams, instead of making proposals directly to the DAO, are making it to the org themselves. And the org is making the decision on how to onboard or offboard teams within their own like local jurisdiction, if you will. Um, and so the reason that we did this is because, again, like radical success will be in how we deploy this treasury in the long term to fund the growth of the radical ecosystem, the growth and the resilience of the radical ecosystem, right? Like, we're not a DeFi protocol, you know? We're, we're trying to build a self-sustaining, community-owned and operated open source project. Um, and so for us, that means, um, you know, learning and taking learnings from DAOs about how we can, like, make it more effective to, you know, coordinate budgets and goals so we're not just, like, negotiating, like, haircuts all the time, you know, is um, I think that that process has led us to this, like, more emergent model that supports the autonomy of these orgs themselves and the governance processes of themselves. So... Um, in terms of like onboarding and offboarding, that means that there needs to be like explicit, like I said, trust levels between the DAO, the orgs, and the teams. Um, and so there's actually like a lot of really, going back to what you were saying about like designing like smart contracts and how we can like be trying out new things instead of like corporate forms, is that there's like a lot of really cool tools like being built by like Gnosis Guild right now um, uh, and with like the Zodiac mods that allow, you know, like the DAO, like DAO the DAO is like a community governed um, entity to delegate trust and revoke trust in really interesting ways. So like one of those is like, I forget what mod it's called, but like the guard mod, I think, um, in which a DAO can send funding to a multi-sig, but then there could be a mod built into the safe um, that allows the community to revoke the funds from the multi-sig, um, overriding the, the signatures on the multi-sig. When you think about that, that's a really powerful thing because we're able to rebalance and redistribute the power of delegating and revoking trust among an organization and create more autonomous flows for that. Um, which I think better supports the emergence of an ecosystem because you're not just having these like gatekeepers deciding who's onboarded and who's not offboarding. And so that's really important when you're trying to develop more headless brands in which people can be onboarding to the ecosystem and doing it in a way that's autonomous 
meaning the power is distributed, yet the community also has the power to kind of keep it in check. And so these checks and balances, I think, are like incredibly, incredibly important. And that's, I think, our current challenge that I'm really excited to be diving into now, which is like, how can we be encoding those rules that embed those checks and balances between the community, the orgs themselves, which represent, you could say, the trusted actors in the ecosystem, and then the ecosystem that those orgs are funding, um, and then the general community of people who are uh, participating and, um, and uh, supporting like the radical projects. So it's all about like kind of like looking at all these different participants and figuring out how to best distribute power and trust to support like the emergence of the ecosystem without just kind of doing this like whole like spray and pray approach to just like no with no accountability or like no um, you know mechanisms for recourse. So amazing. That's super interesting, and I, that's super important. Trust is super important, but then also, like, I want to talk about process because I think both DAOs and like more centralized foundations really struggle with this because like we can give a grant, but then how do you ultimately like report on the success of that grant, and how do you track milestones? Because same as in Maker, like a, a, a core unit or a facilitator can get money, but then it's it's the facilitator's sole responsibility or like the team's responsibility to then like see through how. Um, that team is allocating funding, and like Juan, you can talk about later uh, more so like the challenges with that. But Alba, I know you're developing a lot of actual like tooling with the proposal inverter for how you can um, how you can go about like putting together a proposal, getting funding for that proposal, tracking milestones, and then reporting on those milestones. Uh, so I'd love to hear your perspective on this Thank from you, process yeah. perspective. Um, so I think like uh, we have like this traditional again know-how that has been working for the last 20 years, like. Uh, that has circulated around two, two trillion dollars, I think, uh, globally. Um, United Nations, World Bank, EU, they always fund milestone-based funding. They require proof of work, as in like upload documentations, they assign you mentors and program managers. Um, and I think that's kind of what you touched upon as well, like uh, it's kind of mycelium, like a mushroom network in a way, if you, if you would like to say, where you need to have hand-holding in the culture and you need to make sure this hand-holding has a cultural infrastructure that has been built upon, right? So that's what really uh, interests me in the end of the day with milestone and deliverables. So if you could actually write a proposal and every, we could separate the funders to ecosystem funders and verifying funders. So ecosystem funders being uh, trying to incentivize the communities and individuals to build on top of their infrastructure and verifying funders being the subject matter experts who can like look at the projects and understand the, again, requirements, problems and what can be done. And if we could coordinate that, I think like we can get to a level of this trust layers where ecosystem funders can trust the verifying funders, where verifying funders can verify the actual builders of that ecosystem. So um, that's kind of what we're trying to achieve with the Mertz Network now. We are building like this mechanism where you can write a proposal, apply to any grant application or like a DAO funding through that or traditional organization funding apps as well like African Grants Program in Tanzania. And then uh, they will ask you additional questions according to their cultural infrastructure that they built upon. May that be KYC or like uh, specific requirements about the contributors and builders. And then uh, it's basically milestone based funding where you have to upload the work, you have to provide the feedback. As a funder, you have to provide the feedback and as a builder, you have to provide the feedback so we can have this uh, feedback loops uh, in the end of the day. So just to give it an example from the invert. Yeah, I like the mycelium networks. I think checks and balances should actually be reframed as like symbiotic relationships. It's technically the same thing. And I actually think we have more potential to build symbi symbiosis between like participants in a system than like just checks and balances to like reframe the language and, and instead of applying like all of our like political corporate form stuff to it, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think that eventually we need all the, the tools to make it super easy for anyone and, and make sure that it's, uh, that it's extremely easy and, and the guardrails are in place. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to you know if you're in terms of grants and if you're using any type of uh, specific tools uh, that you have liked or, or, or if you follow a more manual process. Uh, personally, at Maker is extremely manual. Um, you mean like Notion? <laughs> <laughs> like all yeah, of the DAOs run on Notion? <laughs> Everything runs on Notion? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Notion uh, pipeline? <laughs> so How many times can you say Notion on this panel? <laughs> We've been toying with, uh, with different tools. Um, and yeah, look, looking forward to, to find one that, that will actually work. Uh, I think that's also a, an industry that will help us a lot uh, in terms of tooling and, and, and grants, but I think we need to reach that point where it's almost permissionless um, and there's almost no, no one to, to, yeah, to, to verify it, right? Eventually, I don't know, use Claros or something, but uh, I hope we get there. 
Yeah, and we've experimented with a few um, like grants <coughs> automation tooling. I mean, well, first of all, like yes, we do actually use a Notion pipeline to track grants, and we we have an application that comes in. Like we have this whole process that we built out, where like an application goes in, it gets assigned uh, like a few reviewers. Um, they like based on their area of expertise. The way that we do grants is by vertical. So like if there's like an NFT vertical, or like I personally fund community and ecosystem uh, or community and education grants. So like I would review that vertical and then we have like a whole process for moving that grant down a pipeline. We, in the future, like we really wanted to experiment more with um, like open decision making and being able to post um, all those applications to like a public forum. But then the challenge with the foundation is we can't always disclose um, like exact applications or like what people are, the amounts that people are requesting for. So some of the way that we've tried to solve this is one tool we're gonna pilot is Questbook. Or not Questbook, Questbook. Yes, Questbook is one of the, no. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Isn't that an accounting software? That's not what I'm trying to say. It's grand. QuickBooks. QuickBooks, okay, 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 Questbook, Questbook, we're on Questbook. Um, and Climate Collective, which is actually one of the first, or I guess the second uh, independent entity that has gotten money from the protocol to specifically fund like climate and refi related projects, they're gonna experiment with Questbook as a way to do like more decentralized and more open um, grants process. But then the other way is like we just use Gitcoin grants as well and like we match, we do matching rounds on Gitcoin grants, like that to me is one of the like best open source, like open community participatory ways to do grants that's external to an ecosystem. Um, and I think we're still learning. So yeah, if anyone is building uh, grants tooling, I I'd wanna, love to know. I wanna give a shout out to our grants lead, uh, Boredom, who was actually someone who came through the community and now leads our grants program. We're only in, we just finished the first season, starting up the second season now. Um, but their approach to grants is really cool and I think is something that I'd like to see more in the space in which I don't think grants should just be this like single, singular like one dimensional type of funding and that grants are an opportunity to again like not only source more people and grow an ecosystem but to provide uh, and develop people within an ecosystem and so um, what they're doing with like the grants program is actually trying to reframe it kind of as a little sub DAO, build its own governance processes, have its own management um, that allow uh, for people, not only for um, other orgs within the Radical DAO, such as like the core development org, which is the core teams, to direct work by submitting like RFPs or something, but to also um, experiment, and this is what they're going to start doing now, uh, with how you can even decentralize the decision making of the grants itself, right? Which I think is like another means of creating more autonomy in these funding sources, um, instead of it being kind of like, uh, our, it's like not our foundation grants program, right? It's Boredom's grant program and Boredom is listening and kind of creating a symbiotic relationship with like the core teams themselves. And so there's a lot of cool tools, like for example, they're using um, Otter Space badges, which are basically like these like non-transferable NFT badges to um, create, uh, you know, a, like spawn a membership model that exists within the DAO and can be recognized by the parent DAO, um, but have its kind of own structure. Uh, integrate that with Snapshot, and now you have like a decentralized governance system that's like very, very scoped um, to uh, the participants in within that certain realm of the ecosystem. And I think that that's gonna be a really cool experiment in how can you, again, support the emergence of these kind of like independent funding streams that have their own mandate, yet also, um, you know, create these trusted relationships so that like other orgs can kind of check the power of the grants and uh, the DAO has to kind of approve of like allocating funds. Um, and so I think that that will be like a really good uh, experiment moving forward um, and, you know, seeing what tooling can kind of support that type of organization. Yeah, totally. And also, um, Alp, I know that Prime has done a lot of work on like Prime rating and conviction voting as a way to also like separate signal from the noise and understand which grants are like worthwhile funding. Can you tell us more about how you think about that? Yeah, um, so basically the main concept is conviction model, so which would be, uh, again, a trust layer. So yeah. if you would to recognize specific grant programs and like be satisfied with their um, approach to the grants, hand-holding uh, the projects that they select and the, the way that they actually uh, onboard them to their culture and their organization at a very high level. So they can actually participate in their governance, participate in the decision-making process. So once a co uh, the conviction model works like when a grant program approves a grant and provides a feedback, so how, how can they track the other grant programs in the ecosystem and see their feedback and like kind of generate this feedback loop on uh, with, for individuals and also the projects that the individuals are working on. 
So that's kind of my approach. Like we need more transparency in terms of like the grant funding. We need more transparency in terms of like the, the way that we build things together because we have this coordination, which uh, it's a human coordination. We all know each other for a while. We've been working together for a while. And uh, like this kind of ex ex accelerates us as well to a certain degree. We have a specific understanding of what we're building. I mean, to provide that to the newcomers, to this ecosystem, to our ecosystem, and we kind of need to, I feel like, uh, you know, like build brick by brick uh, and make sure that we have a solid infrastructure and onboard people to that um, in a way. Yeah, totally. And from the perspective of a contributor or from a perspective of someone who is maybe newer to the ecosystem, like do you, any of you have any like key takeaways or advice for how can someone get involved who wants to like grow an ecosystem um, either like at a protocol level or like open source ecosystem in general, or, or build tools for grant uh, funding. Anyone can jump in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I find that uh, I, I, I want to touch a bit on the bull versus bear market uh, situations, and, and it's crazy how um, when it's a bull market, you see a lot of, I don't know, DAOs or contributors uh, popping up like mushrooms after a rainy day. But then when you move to the bear market, everyone's panicking and then everyone's thinking about the, the token holders. So it's interesting this perspective of, of how you go back and forth. Um, and I was actually thinking about what Simona said about uh, that not all the organism needs to move at the, f the same pace. And then how do you manage like how how do you know when when it's time to cut that part to make sure that the whole survives to to not uh, yeah to not kill the whole thing because of of of, of one part and uh, with that in mind um, it's uh, I think it's a, it's a great time to to build and focus on providing value I think the the bear market is, is great for that it definitely uh, cleans a lot of the of what Peter Pan was saying about the kumbaya daos. Um, so we'll we'll see what the what the real value is, um, but but yeah, if you're a contributor and, and you want to join, potentially find uh, a, a, yeah an, an organization that you like that aligns with your values, start to provide value, and eventually you I think you will be picked up. Uh, right now, we, we like to say we like to say that DAOs are are, are leader f uh, leader full instead of leader less. Um, but the truth is that I don't think that everyone wants to be a leader, maybe. Uh, so some people really like the framework to, and, and be like, yeah, being told what to do. So we need to find those frameworks to make sure that we can onboard not just the, the giga brains and, the, and, and everyone that, that can do that uh, from that perspective, so. I think that, um, I do think that now in the bear market, we're like laying the bricks, we're laying the foundation for kind of the ecosystems to develop. Um, in the next cycle, if you will. Um, and I actually think that there's a lot of projects that are currently navigating successions of power um, for the first time or maybe for the second time, and that there's actually a lot of opportunity for ecosystem leadership to kind of shine. It's hard, though, because I think actually how you get involved is different from down to down, from ecosystem to ecosystem. And often, I think... Um, uh, grants or kind of like trying to achieve some sort of like funding stream through um, an organization is like a great way but there's something more deep there in which like finding um, an ecosystem and a community that you align with principles wise and trying to kind of like participate in uh, that community for like and align yourself with that community. So it's it's tough because I think that a lot of people like, um, for example, like as we were trying to get like our grants program off and running, there was a lot of people who like didn't know how to engage in the process and maybe were like, since we didn't understand how we really wanted to do grants, a lot of people had expectations for how other people did grants. And maybe we, you know, like misaligned, you know, didn't meet people's expectations. And so I think it's tough, but I do think that there's like, if I've seen like I the most, prime examples of ecosystem development in the radical ecosystem. It's come from community members who just started like showing up and, and being in the in forums and in the community and talking and asking questions, who then started answering questions for other people asking questions, who then started being you know the people that you'd go to when you want to distribute power, permissions, or capital. Um, and while for us, we're still kind of like learning about what our ecosystem growth should be, as we also figure out all the other things with radical, it's, I think that, what we're trying to do is like lean into those like more one-to-one 
on like individual like relationships of supporting people like growing into leaders within the community themselves and empowering um, them as they emerge instead of again like gatekeeping it. So um, and I think that that comes with like a lot of like I, th I feel like my answers are more about like what we can do to support people yeah. coming into the ecosystem better and it's like a lot of like like intentional program development you know of not just uh, building an audience but building a community um, it's a lot of like thinking about grants more intentionally not just as distributions of capital but as uh, uh, gateways into kind of like other means of development within a project um, and also kind of embracing more like ecosystem relationships I think um, and kind of like partnerships just to add really quick um so basically, I feel like uh, also as a Web3 free agent, let's say, you know, like mm -hmm. kind of product project agnostic person, the most important thing to the new onboard is, I would say, like, first of all, learn, like mm -hmm. to read a lot. We have a lot of learning curves uh, that you need to go through. But the most important is mentorship, like apprenticeship. That's, that's, that's helped me a lot in Web2, Web3 in my life in general. And I see like uh, we have amazing leaders, amazing people that actually cares about like what they're building, their mission is... Uh, how can we generate public goods, how we can actually improve our society, prosper our, our society. And if you can find these people and like uh, just reach out to them and don't, don't be even shy, you know, like uh, just ask them to mentor you because I think like many people that I know, great leaders in this ecosystem, they, they would love to mentor newcomers and like uh, teach them what they know and learned because we learn as we teach and you teach as you learn, you know. So just want that on top of that. I, I wanted to circle back to, yeah, to the expectations and, and leadership. Um, it seems that the default or the first one out there is the gold standard for anything, uh, which I think is extremely wrong. An example is uh, the delegates in MakerDAO. The first one just started the forum thread saying, this is my platform, and we had a call with them, and that was it. So now every delegate in pretty much the whole industry has the platform, which is just a forum thread, um, and maybe a call introducing themselves to the community. And Delegates in this particular case could be so much more than that. They could provide frameworks, they could provide reports, they could provide so many more things. And, and like, all we're getting is just this, oh, I'm voting this for this reason. Um, and this applies to almost everything. So uh, try to think uh, outside the box. Going back to Alps point, try to provide value when you approach someone instead of give me something to do. It's more like, hey, I thought that this could be of use. What do you think? If you think it's horrible, try to guide me in the, in the right direction. But it's, it's extremely important to try to be proactive and, and, and to help uh, your mentor or, or your to-be mentor to, to help you. Otherwise, you just take a burden that, uh, that no one wants to carry. I, mean, I think we've come full circle to uh, ecosystems being a mycelium network and all of us being mushrooms in the network and that DAOs imitate nature, as Simona pointed out <laughs> earlier in the week. And with that, we only have five more minutes. So if you want to take a couple of questions or just say some closing remarks or where can um, people find you all and connect with you after, after DevCon? We can talk about where we connect and then I can hand my microphone off to anybody who has a question. Um, but yeah, you can follow Radical, Radical is R-A-D-I-C-L-E uh, on Twitter and um, you'll probably seeing, be seeing a lot on our forum, radical.community about the transition. I write discourse like, this is my job now, <laughs> discourse <laughs> posts. And so we have a lot of really cool ones that are kind of like outlining our transition and a lot of really cool stuff there that's happening in the open. Uh, in the open, and you can follow me at Abby, A B B E Y underscore Ticom, T I T C O M B, because I also tweet about this a lot. Awesome. Um, you can reach out to Inverter Network and also Alp, E R G I N T R. Uh, I got a haircut, so uh, the profile picture doesn't <laughs> represent it, but, but you can still find that. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm 0x7u4m, <laughs> which is Juan Justin Lead Speak. Uh, yeah, I have a very common name, so all, all the combinations were already taken. I'm sorry, Mom. Uh, <laughs> mine's just Anna Alexa K on Twitter and Telegram, so anytime, feel free to reach out uh, and continue this conversation. And I'm guessing that this is our cue to get off the stage. Do you have time for one question? Yeah, totally. Luis. Hi, yeah. Um, you were mentioning about like this difference between symbiotic re relationships uh, instead of check and balances, and I would love to know like uh, could you expand a little bit more on that and how how would that look like? Uh, yeah, so I think that it's about um, I think 
wow, I say this word way too much, but I think it's about resilience, right? And that like, when you look at our natural world, <laughs> actually everything is built off of um, not really checks and balances. Like you, I think that that's kind of more of like a competitive way to look at it. Like when something spins out of control, something checks it. However, when you look at like natural symbiotic relationships, um, the difference is because check and balance is like constraining power um, and uh, kind of creating means of like limiting power, where symbiosis is creating relationships that grow and that thrive and that like spawn. Um, and I think that that's kind of the difference in which I think symbiosis, symbiotic relationships are often less of this like linear um, uh, check and balance and more of this like dynamic exponential growth, um, at least from my limited research into microbiology. Um, and I also think that, but I do think that this concept of like thriving versus constraining is the difference that I see in which um, when you think of an ecosystem, you, you see an ecosystem not again as this like, um, I mean, some people do. Again, it goes back to like natural selection if like what you think about like kind of biology in general. But I think newer takes on biology are looking at ecosystems as these like very diverse interconnected networks um, that are all building on each other and are all, and I think we're now realizing the interdependencies. Um, and I think that those interdependencies are not like a, a check and a balance. They're kind of a dependency on each other to survive. And so I think that that's a way more, for me, a more inspiring take on kind of how we can be building ecosystems in general. Because if you're working on inter interdependencies, instead of like one person checking versus the other, um, I think that you can build more resilient ecosystems because we're focusing, and it's like how we, it's honestly something that we embody, and I think in the Ethereum space, off the bat, right, is that we want to be composable, we want to be modular, we want to be supporting each other's ecosystems because together we're more resilient, together we are this like headless thing that is Ethereum, that is like Web3, and that's more of a symbiotic relationship than like a check and balance kind of like competitive thing. So I think it's coming from like a personal opinion, but maybe totally. that makes sense a little bit. I think <laughs> what makes sense to me is like, it's switching the model from like one to many relationship where it's like one person at the top having connections to many people to many to many relationships and it's the bonds between the it's the, it's the bonds between the nodes in the network versus like one person towards many people any more questions okay great thank you so much for coming yes, and for sticking around and thank happy you. end of defcon everyone wow thank you all for being the last panel